stand with us and sing, please? I think we're ready to go now. It is a beautiful Sabbath day. Let's sing. into your presence and worship before you are God and our King. You've called and saved us, and so therefore we call you our King and Savior. And we gather to learn from you. Be with us as we worship you, as we learn from you, as your spirit moves around with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please be seated? We're delighted you're here this morning. We're going to have our children's story coming up. And as is our tradition, the children come around and they gather bucks from you. If you have dollars that you can get rid of, it helps our school for the children. In fact, it puts one student through our school, and we're delighted when you can help. So if you have some extra dollars, they'll come around. They're already standing out in the aisles, I see. And they'd be happy to <laughs> take some money off of you. If you have a few dollars to help, they would appreciate that.
it warm outside? Is it sunny outside? What do we call this season? Summer, yeah. We're trying to, I, spring, we just flooded right past spring, didn't we? Yeah. Well, I have a book to share with you, and you guys may have read this. It's called Mama. Is it summer yet? Have any of you read that? No? Well, it starts out with a little boy asking if it is summer yet. He says, Mama, is it summer yet? Not yet, my little one, but the earth is soft. Soon the seeds will sprout and root. Time passes. Mama, is it summer yet? Not yet, my little one, but the swallows are singing and soon warmer winds will blow. They keep going. Mama, is it summer yet? Not yet, my little one, but the trees are blooming and soon tiny apples will appear. I was reading this book to my kids the other day and I was thinking, can you imagine what's going on up in heaven? Sometimes I imagine little angels. Jesus, are they coming yet? Not yet, my little angels, but we are preparing magnificent homes for when they arrive. Jesus, are they coming yet? Not yet, my little angels, but we are preparing a wonderful celebration, a marvelous feast. Jesus, are they coming now? Not yet, my little angels, but we are preparing beautiful crowns and beautiful robes for them when they arrive. So, as you see summer coming our direction, be sure you point your eyes up towards the sky and imagine what might be going on as Jesus prepares a home for us. Would you like to say a prayer for us? Mama, would you like to say a prayer? Do you want to? Who would like to say a prayer? Any volunteers? Dear Jesus, please help us to have a good day. Thank you that it's Sabbath. And please help those who are sick to feel better soon. Amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Happy Sabbath to you all. We want to uh, welcome our guests today who've traveled to be with us and to worship with us. And we want to invite our guests to uh, join us for a fellowship dinner afterwards in the gymnasium. Welcome that time together as we worship and serve our great Savior. A few announcements this morning. I uh, would direct your attention to this white piece of paper you were given when you walked in. That's a bulletin. And in that bulletin you will find the announcements that describe the work of this church. And uh, we hope that you will look at that and become involved as the Lord moves you to. Uh, I would like to add a few things to this. Uh, there's going to be a security meeting uh, with the security uh, group uh, this uh, on the 12th, so put that on your calendar. I think it'll probably be in the evening, so um, please put aside that time, uh, those who are on that committee. Um, I have just been reminded that uh, several years ago we had a golf tournament here to raise money for the Stone House, 
And we do have some uh, golf towels for you duffers. And uh, we have hats. And we have some coats left. So if you would like to continue to support the Stone House, you can make a small donation, and that will help that Stone House. If, by the way, we invite our visitors to take a, a, a short walk across the parking lot and see the Stone House. It's over 100 years old, made out of native granite. It's quite a structure if you haven't seen it. We invite you to see that. Um, uh, we, I was re reminded today that a pastor will uh, complete his series on uh, youth, adult, um, how, how is that? Young adults in the church. Last night was a very informative uh, presentation or a beginning to a three-part series about the, the changing cultures and how it affects the church through the youth. So uh, he'll be speaking about that today during his sermon, and also the third part of the series will be at 1.30 today. So you could put that on your list of things to do today. I believe that is all the announcements that I see here. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second to give us time. Oh, there's a hike today. I was just reminded that my wife wants to make sure everybody goes for a walk today. She is hosting it. So, Wendy, would you raise your hand? If you have a question about that, you can talk with her. Um, I just wanted to pause for a second. And uh, at this time in our worship service, we enter the worship of giving. And thinking about what's going on in the world right now, and the difficulties and challenges that faced both Christian and non-Christian. And I was reminded last night by Pastor Bill that our giving, specifically today for local church budget, goes beyond that. And he reminded us that we are a church here that is part of a larger church that goes out into the world in many different ways to serve and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as we consider our giving today, keep that in mind. It is for local church budget, but think of our church, this church, as a worldwide church. Uh, deacons, would you come forward, please? And they will serve you after we pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we take this time, Lord, to worship in giving and acknowledge that you have given us all things in life in the many, many various ways that you've blessed us. Your grace is abundant and deep, and we acknowledge that. And now, Lord, we respond. We respond by giving a little of what you've given us. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless this giving, those who can, those who can't, every small or large gift to proclaim your word in this community and in this country and in this world. We pray these things always in the name of Jesus. Amen.
it's all about you, Jesus. You may be seated. And draw me close will be our opening song. Please come forward as usual for our prayer time together. We will sing it through twice. Before we um, pray, there's a few special needs in this church family. I'd like to mention the Denton family with the loss of Dean Denton, longtime member of the Truckee Church, beloved man. Uh, we want to lift up the Joe family. And Marcella, of course. Um, also, as we, Lorraine Stoke, thank you very much, Lena, longtime member of this church also with health, health issues, I believe. Yes, thank you. Uh, also, the, our general conference is going to be meeting together this summer in Austin, Texas, to consider the direction of the church and some challenging questions, challenging challenges, and uh, 
I think we should pray for our general conference that uh, the Spirit of God will lead them in their decisions. And also, uh, we want to think of those that have suffered great loss from volcanoes and earthquakes. So would you kneel as possible, if possible? <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we come and kneel before you and pause just a minute to consider the times we live in, the challenges, the pain, the difficulties. We're so insulated here, Father, that we don't feel the pain of others in this world. But we sense that your coming is near and we rejoice in that. You've given us work to do and we pray, Lord, that you'll lead us in that work. Challenge us, Lord. Give us faith and hope as we share your word every day as your spirit leads us. We think of those in this church family that are suffering with loss or health issues. We lift them up to you. And we just take a time, Lord, to lift up those people in our life, in our lives that we carry a burden for, the burden you've laid upon us, those who have gone astray, those personal friends who struggle with difficulties and pain. You know each one of them, Father. We pray for them, our children, our. But as we do that, Lord, it's bittersweet. It is bittersweet. A broken world and a promise of a new world to come. We thank you for that. We praise you. Now, Lord, as we worship and we hear your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will move among us and touch our hearts and move us to action. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, Lord, your beauty your face is all I see, and when As was mentioned, this is a two-part, three-part series. One part was last night, uh, dealing uh, with young adults and the church. This part today is in two parts. There is the first part this morning and then one at 1.30 this afternoon. Um, this has grown out of my ministry and out of my uh, doctoral work, uh, and particularly caring for young adults and their ministry and what is happening with them within the church. So. That gives you a little bit of background. If you were not here last night, I'm going to catch you up just really quick, uh, not to uh, belabor this too long. But uh, last night we discussed a little bit about how the culture has changed. Uh, the culture is not the same as it has been, and there have been giant culture swings that have taken place in our world. Most of us who have been in the church for a long time are among the builders, the seniors, those who are older and more mature, and then there are the boomers, and those are my age, those who were born after, um, after 1964. Uh, so those, those ages, kind of, you're laughing about that, aren't you? So um, it have happened. So we as uh, older folks, we kind of see that kind of taking place and going on 
in our world, we kind of sit back with our great wisdom that nobody listens to anymore. But the younger generation, they come along and they are more excited about what's happening and they kind of understand and they see that the culture has changed, that things are different. They act different, as you can see, and that they do different things. But the church kind of tends to go along saying all is well, all is well. Even though the waters around us are rising, say all is well, all is going as it is. I recommended a book last night, and that's called Soul Tsunami. Soul Tsunami is written by uh, Leonard Sweet. Leonard Sweet's book on Soul Tsunami it has about 400 pages, giving examples of how you can see where the culture has changed. It's a very interesting read uh, book. I invite you, if you would like to pick that up, you can get that at Amazon.com. Soul Tsunami, it's a great book, Leonard Sweet. Uh, to look at that. But we looked at the culture. There have been huge cultural swings. We lived through a time for many, many centuries dealing with what we would call the medieval age. And that age was the time up to about 1500. Everybody kind of did the same. They had their fields, they had their ox carts, they had their literature. They looked at the world basically in the same way all, all around the world, medieval, particularly those around Palestine and in Europe. Then in about, nine, in about 1500, what happened is we had what we would say the beginning of the modern era. We call that the age of modernity, modernity, the age of the modern era. And the modern era came up, and as it grew up, it came. This was the time when the great invention of Gutenberg's press, where they had movable type. Instead of having to etch one piece to print, movable type certainly revolutionized. So did the explorations they come and they along came the industrial age uh, the age of reason the reformation came on on heels as all of the world came on about democracy the french revolution uh, the revolution here in the united states all those came up in modern dialogue including the reformation and how it interpreted church before they had never organized and made arguments out of logic and reason but the reformation brought that all apart pulled that all together that they had that process together. The third element came as about the 1970s, the end of the Vietnam War. Life changed. And they began to teach within various universities that the modern era had ended. The idea that logic and reason could solve all of our problems. They said it's too bad. It doesn't. It doesn't solve all our problems. And so the postmodern era began. And we have recently, in probably the last 10 years, said we think we're past the postmodern era. We weren't sure where we were going with that. You can see how rapidly things were changing. And up came the next element, which was the meta-modernity. And the meta-modernity is different than modern, modern thought in that it takes the concepts of modern thought, but you already know that even though those concepts of which you operate under are false, and they couldn't possibly be true, but you operate anyway as if they were kind of a strange thing. I see the pendulum swinging back in a different direction. I think we're going to go through another process of cultural change as it happens. So hold on to your hats. So the effect of these modern changes, postmodernism that has come in has affected the church and how it does business. It has affected our doctrinal, how we structure our doctrine, how we do our global mission around the world, how we organize our organizational systems of our hierarchy in the new world, and how our financial support systems within Christianity and within the church are changing in what's happening. That was all last night. So today, I would encourage you to please fasten your seat belts, put your tray tables in the, and seat backs in the upright and a lock position, and we'll put all electronic devices on airplane mode as we go forward. So here we get ready as we go. You may not be aware, but Christianity has a serious image problem. It has a serious image problem during our world. And if you have not been aware of what's been happening, you would be surprised if you open your eyes and see how Christianity is facing some really tough times. There's a book out that came from Barna Institute. David Kinnaman is now the new president and uh, CEO of the Barna Research Group. They do incredible research about the church and the effects of the church. They, they've done it. It is the pinnacle of research that's come out of Oxnard, California. They have done some research, and one of the books that he wrote, I'll, I'll refer to the second book this afternoon, one of the books that David Kenneman wrote was Unchristian. 
and it's a report on their research over thousands of young adults that they have reached through the church. It was dealing with basically busters and mosaics. In other words, the ages between 16 and 40 was who they were trying to interview. And so they were going out in that process. And so what they were asking, they wanted to take a quick look and see about the Christian reputation among the world. So I want to focus just a little bit and see where we go with that this morning. First, they looked at and made note of, if you go to young, um, if you look at young adults, young outsiders about Christians, what would be their response? And they're interviewing. So the first part of their survey and what they were doing is say, how will young adults who are outside of Christianity, who don't go to church at all, how would they respond to what the church is, what Christianity is about? You see that, what they're researching, what they're trying to do. So the first response they got was that 91% of them said that we are anti-homosexual. Christianity is anti-homosexual. Next thing they stated was that we are hypocritical. We'll do that in just a few minutes. 85% said the church is hypocritical. There's a difference of how young adults think of that. 87% said the church is judgmental. Christianity is judgmental. These are outside, young adults who are outside the church. Continuing on, they go on and said they were 75% said we are too involved with politics and be involved with that. 72% said we are out of touch with reality. Thanks very much. 78% say we are old fashioned. And we learned last night they would like their traditions, but they would like as we have. It was very confusing. 68% uh, of those outside say we are boring. 64% say we are not accepting of people of other faiths. In fact, you can even go and talk with them among the Baptists, different branches of Baptists. I don't know, there are hundred and some different branches of Baptists, and everyone thinks the other one is a heretic uh, because they don't believe exactly the same. It's kind of funny. Uh, not funny, I guess it's kind of tragic, but they say we don't accept people of other faiths. And they say that 61% are confusing, that Christians are confusing. And they are confused. They are, really don't know what they're talking about. Then he went and said, oh, they said, when it comes to the matters of faith, young outsiders are skeptical of the Jesus schlick. This is a, a key finding in our research, that they were skeptical about what we're trying to do when we're promoting Jesus. When outsiders question our motives, it neutralizes their interest in Christianity. Did you get that? When they're questioning our motives of why we are doing what we are doing, it neutralizes our outreach to them. And so we can't reach them. Rather than being genuinely interested in people for their friendship, we often are seen as spiritual headhunters. Think there's any uh, value in that? Any criticism of that? Uh, these are people who are outside the church, young adults who are viewing Christians 16 to age 40. Now, if we go ahead and look at what about the young adults that are inside the church, these are people that are going to church. How would they view those same things? What would be the difference? How would we share those? So they would say that 80% of churchgoers, young adult churchgoers, say we are anti-homosexual. 47%, that's a lot better, but 47% said we are full of hypocrisy. They say that in the processor 52 percent say this is people are attending church young adults that were judgmental of other people going on they will say we are of us that say 50 percent say we are too involved with politics these are people going to church now young adults 32 percent we are out of touch with reality well that's a lot better that's only a third say we're out of touch with reality they're coming and going to church 36 percent of those that are going to church say we're old-fashioned 27% say we are boring. And then when they go and said not accepting of other faiths, 39% say we're not accepting of other faiths and our, our outreach and so we don't. And 44% and of those who are going to church say we're confusing. These are, these are young adults that are going to church. Hey, we are confusing in what we are doing. You see, basically, Christians and non-Christians alike, they like Jesus of young adults. They like Jesus very much. But it's the church, his followers, that they have a hard time with. 
It's the followers of them. And they do make this definite sep separation. If you saw the video last night, you heard the gentleman saying to him, we need to get back to what Jesus taught. We need to get back to Jesus' activities. Well, Jesus' activities and what he taught, we needed to school him on what that was all about. But that was the case about it. In fact, Dan Kimball, who's very interested in young adults and growth, Dan Kimball, the pastor, wrote, well, they like a book he wrote, they like Jesus, but not the church. They like a very interesting uh, concept about that. Now, would you notice this? If you're familiar with the uh, Westboro Baptist Church, are you familiar with them? The Westboro Baptist Church has been out, and they have all these signs, and they protest about fags uh, can't marry, and it has a text there, and will you, um, and they keep going on. You can see all their uh, things in there and there. And so, therefore, what we found out is that, in actual fact, we have become famous for what we are against instead of who we know. And isn't that tragic, that the church becomes famous for what we're against instead of the person we know. So this morning, we recognize and look and say that most young adults, many, many young adults, get their information uh, and their news it's kind of fun, from the late night television shows. And so they go to bed and they sit and they watch these, these gentlemen as they're sharing back and forth about them about going back and forth. Two of them are retiring, evidently, uh, getting. And they even get their interpretation of what Christianity is about from them. How do you think Christianity is treated? Not too well. Not too well. So th this morning, I thought I would just play with your mind for a little bit and say, what are the big three Adventist issues that we might find within the Adventist church? We are Adventists, most of us. And so it would be interesting to see what do you think the young adults would say are the most uh, most important issues and so I've kind of picked these out and my here's teacher picking out stuff for the students I've picked these out I have not surveyed of Brad Neal we'll come to that later but here's what I think is I've been observing this for a while and looked at the big three issues of those I think number one that they would say is boring number two they would say is we're hypocritical. And number three, they would say, is we're judgmental. Now, we're going to look at those just a little bit. So are we boring? This is really tough for a pastor who's the head of a church to deal with boring. I do not like boring. And when my um, children are saying church is boring, I want to wring their necks. You know, I kind of, not my sermons, for sure. Uh, so uh, when we come and have church, so what happens on Sabbath morning? Sabbath morning boredom. I was uh, working with a gentleman who uh, was an Olympic bicycle racer, and he was number three in the world. Can you imagine that? And he toured in the Tour de France and so forth. And he came to my church and he says, I've been studying, I've been looking, I would like to become a Seventh-day Adventist. And he was a bright young man uh, with his family. And so he came and um, I even got to see his bike, his, hand, his bike that he races on. I didn't touch it, but I, I got to see it, um, that he used in races in the Olympics. And so he was coming into my church where very quickly he learned when the boring part was over and when he needed to show up. And so he knew he had time, and he used to come right in time first, but then he saw the first part of the church, uh, Sabbath school was boring, so he knew if he showed up at 10 o'clock instead of at 9.30, he would come to where the interesting part is. So that's when he'd show up because it was of interest to him, you see. He felt that that would happen. So on Sabbath morning, I want to make sure that I can do something to have Sabbath school be part, and that would be something I think we as a church need to work on, is to have Sabbath school be an important part of what it because we could ask ourselves why should I go to Sabbath school why should I come what is it for me what's in there for me if young adults come to the worship service but not Sabbath school maybe be telling you that they find Sabbath school irrelevant to their lives irrelevant to their lives and what we would normally say and have that is come on go 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 it's boring they would say it's boring it's very boring when they, somebody tells you that it's boring, that means it didn't connect with them, didn't, didn't get them, didn't spark their interest, didn't draw them in. So that would be, say, I would like to 
attack that. Well, let's suppose that we have young adults that are boring. Therefore, if they find Sabbath school and boring, it's likely that their children will not be in Sabbath school either because they won't bother to drag them over there. Well, when I was presenting this uh, earlier, I had some ladies say to me, well, we're not here to entertain. That's exactly right. We're not here to entertain. That's not our part. But we could make Sabbath school have fun, to have fun. So um, I went to the Wisconsin uh, camp meeting. And at camp meeting time, I was, they said, well, you, you have something to know about young adults. Why don't you do something for young adults? And so I said, all right. So I went to, they had a tent for young adults there. And there were probably 30 or 40 people that showed up for camp meeting at Wisconsin for young adults. And they kind of dragged in and so forth. And I said, well, I don't want that. So I said, let's see if we can spice this up a little bit. So we did an agree-disagree thing. This is how it worked. We had a chair for if you agreed with the statement. You had a chair for you disagree. They were facing each other. And we had a moderator. And so the idea was you would ask something about the question, whether you agree or disagree. And you could argue your viewpoint back and forth but you had to be sitting in the chair. So we would talk. If I were doing it this summer, I would say, what about women's ordination? We would sit people in the chair, and we would argue it back and forth. Now, the thing is, you, you um, got to be, say one sentence. You had to be able to fulfill one sentence. If you got tapped on the shoulder, you had to yield and get up and let the next person sit down in the chair. So sometimes I would get in the chair, and I'd start the argument. Usually my wife and I would do this. And we would get it started by going back and forth with each other, and people kind of quickly caught on. And then I would get up, and I'd tap my wife on the shoulder, and we'd switch paces, and I would argue back the other direction. Because I wanted them to know it's all right to express your view or to express a view that you didn't personally hold, you see. And so it became a way to discuss issues without taking it so personally. And really quickly, very quickly, people started coming into the young adults. Because why? It was relevant to them. And so they started showing up, hey, this was kind of fun, I'm kind of learning stuff. And so they would show up. So I think we need to be creative in what we do in our Bible study. Number two, music. I wanted to talk just a little bit about music. Sometimes I get caught in this with different churches about the music of the church and what we're going to do. I want you to understand, reaching young adults, it's not about the band. A church doesn't necessarily have to have a band to reach young adults. We get into that assumption, oh, we got to have a dumb, we got to have drums, we got to have electric guitars, we got to be loud. I was in a church one time trying to reach young adults, and I was sitting there, and it was a huge church, and I was sitting there watching, it was Sunday church, and I was saying, what is the draw? What is it that's keeping young adults here? And as I looked and perceived that and was watching that, it wasn't the band because people were standing. The band was playing. They had lights flashing all over, bubbles coming up, smoke coming up as they were praising God, doing that. And the band was singing. The band was all, I, It was so loud in there that you could not hear your own voice. So as a result, people were not singing. They're just standing. They're not worshiping, are they? They're not worshiping. So that was not part of it. They're doing, they're, oh, we have a really loud band. We have lights flashing. Those are called fog congregations, fog churches, uh, you know, because they just have all this fog coming up and so forth in their worship service to have it. It's not about that. It's not about that. It's not about having prayer. Although, don't nail me on this. Prayer is incredibly important. It's not about having prayer. And this one was the hardest one for me to strive as I was thinking about it. It actually is not about the preaching. It draws young adults not to have happen. What they want to know, what young, young adults, because last night we discovered young adults are more spiritual than the older generations, more spiritual. What they need to have is they did they connect that morning with the living God. That's what needs to happen. I want to feel authenticity in my faith and going. So number one is boredom, I believe. Number two, number two is hypocritical. Well, we're not hypocritical uh, to have happen. There's a difference in how the dictionary defines hypocritical and how young adults generally define hypocritical. Generally, in the d definition in the uh, dictionary, hypocrisy occurs when you profess something that you do not really believe. That's the general definition. But young adults have kind of taken a little bit. Hypocrites are people who are two-faced 
or who have double standards, or who say one thing that say, and then seem to do another to have happen. Well, we would be good there, wouldn't we? We're good there, right? So Adventists, we're good there, have happened. If you're not part of our congregation, you just have to watch this as we go by, but this will, I think, strike a chord with you. Um, we have fellowship dinners. We have fellowship dinners at our church, and we're going to have one very shortly. And so it would be that all Adventists are vegetarians. Is that not correct? All Adventists are vegetarians. While you go to our fellowship dinner, they're all vegetarian. That's very cool. World round. Could have happened. So I was getting ready to have uh, this, this uh, lady, I uh, was preparing here for baptism, and uh, she was asking me a few questions about the church and she so forth, and she asked me this question. She asked me this question. She said, Pastor, she said, are Adventists only vegetarians on Sabbath? <laughs> and she was sincere. Because she was, you know, there was a small town, small church. And she would go out and she'd go to a restaurant and she'd see Adventists there having their hamburgers or their steaks or whatever. I mean, having their, but when it came to Sabbath and she goes to fellowship dinner, it's all vegetarian. So she thought there was something about being vegetarian on Sabbath, you see, about having that, to, have, to be there. So are we keeping it real? <laughs> are we keeping it real? With, with ha happen. The third, third area is, I think is judgmental. Are we judgmental? And last night, I told a story about a young lady, which I'm going to repeat. And she came in, and she was walking into the narthex of the church, and she came up to me, and she, she walked across and said, well, Pastor, what do you think of my tattoo, my new tattoo? And what am I going to know how it responds? I do it, oh, oh, wow, wow, okay. Yeah because I didn't want to endorse it and say, because she may not go get another one, or she may tell the people the pastor thinks we should get, all get uh, to, um, go good tattoos. I didn't want to give that kind of an impression. It happened. She was testing me to see if I would accept her with her tattoo. She was seeing if the church, and primarily the pastor, would he still love her, still care about her, if she had a tattoo. So if you have a tattoo, don't worry about it. I do, except they don't worry about it. I, I, I just don't think we need to let Christ would welcome them, and I think I need to welcome them. Why? They don't need my judgment. In fact, as a pastor, they didn't call me here to be a judge, to have happen there. So why makeup? Why do ladies wear makeup? Oh, they do that. Some say, oh, we shouldn't wear makeup. Why don't we wear makeup? Generally, women put makeup on makeup on to make themselves feel prettier that they are somehow they have deficiency my mother my mother used to put on just a little bit of lipstick on her lips even when she went to church because if she didn't she had no lips there was no different color it, it just wasn't there it just it looked really odd you know so she put a little on because of her coloring so it looked like you're normal to have happen I had a secretary. She was very, very light skinned. Very, and unless you put makeup on, she looked like there wasn't a face there. You know, you kind of look two holes and some eyes, you know. So she put a little bit on so she could, so she could see, like, wouldn't people gawk at her going, what in the world has you know, happened to you? So those kind of things that we do. So, so do we need to judge that? Young adults are far more accepting of others than all other demographic groups. The worst tend to be the seniors. We tend to, don't be offended. Then the boomers come up, and they're a little more tolerant, but they still uh, can cast judgment upon it. But young adults are very open to other people. So we're a loving church here, right? We're a loving church. That's right. So Barnum went back, and he said he did some things, and he did some back in Unchristian. He was interviewing different people to say, well, how are we? How are we inside? So the book goes back and shares. And so he asked pastors, and 76% of the pastors, 76, what happened to the other 25%? 76% of the pastors said, yes, we are a loving church. Of course we are. Of course we are. We are a loving, I don't care what you think, uh, pastors. When they asked born-again Christians, woo, 47% said we're loving. Wow, we lost a quarter percent there. When they ask churchgoers, these are churchgoers in general, 41% said we are a loving church. 
And when we talked about outsiders, 20%, 20% of all ages said we have a loving church. I'm talking about Christianity, Christian churches in general. And when we go on to ask young adults, they're more skeptical, young adult outsiders, 51% disagree that we are a loving church. Boomer outsiders, 41% disagree. See that difference? They're not as tolerant. You see the young adult difference? Uh, young adult insiders, 38% disagree. And uh, the boomer insiders, 23% disagree with that kind of a statement they were. So why would that, what they think matter? Why does it be of concern? All right. I had an opportunity to get acquainted with Roger Dudley. Dr. Dudley has a, been a youth leader and youth director and teaches youth ministries. He's now a professor emeritus. One, and I love to just, he's one of those individuals that you go and talk to for a little bit, and he's always stuff is still coming out of him. You know, he just kind of, little tidbits, you go, ooh, that was so good. You know, and you want to just kind of trail along behind him because it's like crumbs falling out of a sandwich. You just want to pick him up as you go. As you know, so I, I liked always running into the hallway with him and talking with him. Well, I was asking him. I was asking him about it, and I said, what is the issue? What is the dropout factor that we are facing here? And he told me it was between 50 and 75% loss, depending on the area. This is much less than other denominations, by the way, many other denominations. And then I picked up his book, and I went into his book and his reading, The Disengagement of such a large percentage of well-educated young adults who should now be assuming leadership in the church threatens the future viability of our movement. We cannot predict the future, but the frightening possibility that the present picture represents tomorrow's reality. We should involve our leaders and members in some serious consideration. Like Social Security, the impending problem will be easier to address now than if we wait until the system breaks down. The church can have no higher priority, I underlined that, than uh, stemming the loss of young adults and winning back those who have left the church. No higher priority. And then I thought about that and learned about that and thought about, uh, he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. And so the church must respond and must do something to help win back the young adults that come back into the church and come back and be participate in the uh, event. What should, what, uh, why should it matter? Where one, as he suggested in his writing, one, I don't know, my battery is going dead. Uh, the future viability of our movement is threatened. The spiritual uh, lives of those young adults are being threatened, also being threatened. And we also have, sorry, um, please, the plea is to save my kids. Please save my kids. When I went to Wausau, I looked around in the church. There were about 45 people attending. Most of them were boomers and um, seniors, builders and, senior and boomers. And only a one couple had a little couple of children there. And I began to wonder what in the world was going to happen. And I said, no higher priority than winning those back and getting those back. And some of the elders that were on my group there looked and said, my kids no longer attend church, no longer come. And we can't, we can't just let that go by. We just can't pretend that it doesn't exist. They're looking for deeper spirituality. Are we going to be able to provide that? Are we going to be able to do that? This is why we find the GYC coming up. The GYC's whole emphasis was to bring young adults back into an atmosphere of deeper study and love for Christ. That was their goal. That was what they were working for and trying to happen. They sensed that something needed to be done. That was their response to it. Ravi Zacharias wrote the book, The Cries of the Human Heart, and I was interested. There were several chapters in there that I thought were important. He said they have a dream job, beautiful kids, the best marriage, and a growing feeling of absolute emptiness. Absolute emptiness. One chapter has to deal with a cry to know God. The human heart has a cry to know God. We find that in our society. Another chapter says the cry to feel my faith. Young adults want to feel their faith. They want to see something is actually happening to them. There is number chapter 6 deals with a cry of a lonely heart. Feeling alone in this world because we're in a digital age. 
So serious questions that we can ask uh, young adults in our quest is, and as they are asking is, at the worship service, can I sense an encounter with the living God? Where's the passion and excitement for God? And to be truthful to you, I've been, I've pastored some churches that if I had not been the pastor, I would not have gone. And I'm going, because it was so dead. I had one church that I'll talk about this afternoon. I'll wait till then. Be sure you're here this afternoon. You'll want to miss that. Number two, can I, act can I actually see God answering my or our prayers? If we're praying to God, we're asking him to do that. Can I actually see him answering our prayers? Number three, when we say we're concerned about our community, do we really mean our concern is to convert them to being an Adventist or to being a Christian? Is that really our concern? Number four, there are things the church does that really bug me. Where can I express it safely? Where can I talk about it? Number five, are we as Adventists always right about everything? Young adults, actually, yeah, of course, yes, thank you very much. Number six, I would like to really study my Bible and see what God has to say to me, see that personal thing, but how, how can I find that within my Bible to do? Jesus called us to say we are to seek and to save that which was lost, and that was Jesus' mission. That is what we're to be about. Now, every message has to have a text, so here comes my text right at the very end. Last slide for you. Here's my text. And that is this. The men of Ishkar understood the times and knew what Israel should do. The men of Ishkar understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. The men and women of Riverview understood the times and they knew what they should do. This afternoon I'm going to talk about what we should do. What we should do. There in Wausau, we had 45 in attendance. Two years later, there were very close to 200 most of them young adults. It wasn't because we had a great band. It was because the church reached out and found relevance for them. And they came and came and came. It's not rocket science. It's not. It's retooling our thinking. Dear Lord, I ask you be with us as we process and think about how we can reach out to our young adults, to our community around us. We understand the times. We can see that. We ask, Lord, that you will help us that their salvation may be offered to these young adults. Bless them. Call them. We know you hold them in your heart. May we hold them in our heart as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. After, uh, after we eat together, we will uh, meet back here at 1.30. You're all welcome to come to in dinner with us. May God bless you.